So here we are. This is the raw room. This is my studio where I come every day. I always come in here about half past ten and I stay in here till one o'clock when I come out for lunch. Oh, here she goes. And then he has his lunch and then he comes back into the studio at two o'clock, gets down and comes out again at four o'clock for tea and then goes back in and sort of winds up the day and comes out at six o'clock and has a bath. And that's my routine. And, and she drives my wife mad. But I always argue that Stravinsky had a similar one. Now, I'm not putting myself on the same level as Stravinsky, but he was one of my heroes, so maybe that's the reason. <laughs> Music is it. Music is my life. And I've got all this lovely equipment that I've gathered over the years. Admittedly, it's pretty old now. A lot of this stuff is almost at the end of its life. But the reason I don't change it is because you've got your sound. If you change it, it won't be the same raw band as, as everybody knows and loves. So I came into music very late, really, compared to most people, because uh, most guys who become professional musicians start when they're like seven or eight or nine. I didn't. I didn't even do music at school. I ran away to sea when I was about 17, went to Merchant Navy College and then went to sea for two years. Now, on one of the trips to sea, the previous guy who occupied my cabin was um, a cadet who played the guitar and he left his guitar behind. I'll, I'll have a go at that. So I rushed ashore and bought a, a How to Play the Guitar and I got better and better, and I used to listen to Voice, Voice of America, America Jazz Hour, which was on shortwave radio, playing jazz. And I really got into jazz, and I thought, this is great, and I was practicing on the guitar playing jazz, and I got quite good. Came ashore, and in the evenings, I was playing jazz in jazz clubs. And I thought, well, we've got to go, go, go the whole hog, and we moved down to London, and I started to get gigs in London, and I got better and better, and, um, Oh, oh. <laughs> Hello, Millie. I thought, right, I'll try and write something, never having written music at all. I taught myself how to write and I wrote some, a little tune and I took it to the Guildhall School of Music where you could then study with a very famous composer for nine pounds a term, believe it or not. And um, he looked at it and he said, you know, I think you might have something here. So I went and studied with Edmund Rubra and then I was introduced to, by a friend of mine, to a guy called Peter Asher. Now, Peter Asher, his sister was going out with Paul McCartney at the time. Peter was a bass player. And we had a little trio and we played around at Peter's house in, in uh, London. Paul McCartney was there quite a lot of the time. And he had discovered a Welsh folk singer called Mary Hopkin, who was on um, Opportunity Knox, I think, the program. He, he wanted to produce the record to, to, to give this girl, you know, a platform anyway. So Paul wanted to find an arranger who wasn't really a pop arranger, but there were plenty of pop arrangers at the time. And Peter, my friend, said, well, why don't you try Richard? He's just been to college, he's got a lot of knowledge, and he, he, he could probably arrange it for you in a different style. So that was my first gig as a pop arranger. And, of course, it went round the world to number one, which was brilliant. Once you've had a big hit as an arranger, you get a lot of calls. And I started doing arrangements for all, all people all around the world. I mean, Simon and Garfunkel, Diana Ross, Carly Simon, lots of big names. And then one call came, <laughs> which turned out to be um, very interesting, was from Apple Records, uh, from the Beatles company. Paul McCartney had written a song for the Let It Be album called Long and Winding Road. And he and John had fallen out at the time. John didn't think the record uh, was up to it, you know, the album wasn't right. He wanted Alan Klein to come in and what he called clean up the, the album. Paul McCartney was not aware of what was going on at all. Alan Klein came in and hired Phil Spector, Wall of Sound man who used to use massive orchestras, to put an arrangement on Paul. It was just Paul on the piano. So they called me Apple because they knew I'd worked with Paul before not telling Paul about it at all. They called me and said, uh, could you come and meet Phil Speck because he wants to put a big arrangement on Long and I said, great, you know, that's, that's what I love. I love doing big orchestras. That's my, my scene, okay. Uh, not knowing that Paul didn't know about it. 
I went in and Phil said, hey, you want a big orchestra? I said, oh, well, eight violins, four cellos, that sort of thing. And he said, uh, no, no, 20 violins, 40 cellos, or whatever it was, huge orchestra, two harps. Blimey, I thought, but this is going to be good, but it uh, doesn't sound like the Beatles to me, but I'll do it. We had so many musicians there, I don't think we had enough stands for them. And we recorded it with Phil, uh, who, who was a very strange man. I think we did about 10 takes, and then the musicians started, said, look, look, Richard, we can't do any more. We, we played it, because the, uh, they always play it perfectly first time anyway. And that was it. I never heard any more. Till it came out, that was a massive hit in America, and then I got off. A, a letter saying that Paul McCartney was furious that he didn't even want an arrangement on this record he wanted it to be piano and voice and that's all uh, and bass and drums um, I said oh well I'm sorry but uh, I, I just did the job I was asked to do you know and he actually toured with a scaled down version of the arrangement and I saw him and I said uh, well it didn't do bad after all did it Paul <laughs> mm. Arrangers don't get royalties, they, they only get a fee. And I thought, well, it's, it's okay, but you know, I'd like to get a bit more some of my music out there. So I can play the guitar, so I can play the bass because it's very similar. I've got a keyboard, I'll try and make a pop record. No, I didn't know much about pop music. I thought, I mean, the nearest I got, I thought Dusty Springfield must be a cowboy. It sounded like a cowboy, you know. I got, bought a little desk, it was only about four tracks, I think and plugged it all in with my guitars and I, I, th I played it and it sounded okay but I thought yeah it, it sounds like a guitar I don't want it to sound like a guitar I want it to sound a bit more yeah a bit crunchy you know and so I, what I did was I plugged my old electric piano into a guitar pedal which was a wah wah pedal which you if you normally could go wow 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 when you when do it but I drove it so hard with the electric piano that it overloaded it and it made this real lovely crunchy sound which I actually worked the pedal with my hand to get it more in time. It all sounds like synthesizers but it's actually guitars and pianos through pedals. I had a basic track and to me it sounded good but I, I had no idea about pop music. Dubbed on the, a, a, dr a drummer called Andrew Steele who vanished after this track and I wonder if I'd frightened him off. But anyway, he did a brilliant job with Tom Tom. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba really good. And I put a brass section on it with some hard-nosed jazz players that I knew. So the Crunch record was born, an actual finished track. I was quite pleased with it. And I played it to one guy from EMI and he said, oh God, this is good, this is great. I'm and then they put it, started to put it in the clubs and it picked up, it got club attention, you know, and it was a big club hit. Still goes around the clubs even now. And that's how it was eventually released as a record, as a pop record. And of course, crept up the charts. Took a long time actually, but it did eventually get to number six. So that's the Ra Band, the birth of the Ra Band. The Ra name, incidentally, came from my initials, R-A-H, obviously, Richard Anthony Hewson. It's a good job my mum didn't call me Brian, or there might have been Bar Band. <laughs>